story of the Pacific and its people, of the peaceful sea and the lands and lives it touches, and their meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and dedicated to a fuller understanding of the vast Pacific Basin. This broadcast series comes to you as another public service with drama of the past and present and commentary by Dr. H. H. Fisher, authority on Russia and professor of history, Stanford University. The Soviet Asiatics, a new human world. Where the waters of the Pacific wash up on Soviet Asia has developed a strategic stronghold. In the landlocked regions behind the maritime provinces of Siberia, there is the ceaseless roar of blast furnaces, powerhouses, mines, factories. And manning this incredible development are more than a hundred different peoples, Uzbeks, Buryats, Kalmuks, Yakuts, Turkomans, Tajiks, Kyrgyz. During World War I, many of these peoples were in open revolt against the Russian government. Today, they are fighting in the ranks of the United Nations, and they bid fair to play an important role in the great Pacific era that lies ahead. One of the republics of Soviet Asia is the Kyrgyz Soviet Socialist Republic. My people have been nomads for centuries. This is a Kyrgyz chief. We have wandered through Central Asia. Money means little to us. Our wealth as our sheep and cows and yaks. We raise Bactrian camels and we use them for beasts of burden. Look at this Kyrgyz chief, and you see he is a Mongol. He is of a Turkic tribe, slant-eyed, tawny skin, sturdy, self-reliant. His home is in the heart of Central Asia, where the borders of China, India, and the Soviet Union meet. My people have been here a long time. They can remember the time of the rule of the Khans before the Russians came. They can remember when people accused as criminals were punished by being thrown down from the Khan's high death turrets. And we remember the days of the Tsars when the Russians came and took much of our land. We say that the Tsars came astride the cannon. More soldiers to force the Russian will upon us. Yes. First they built a fortress in our village, and now more and more soldiers are coming. They come here like conquerors. They will have no mercy on us. After the soldiers came and built the fortress, then the terrorist officials came. Whoever among the Kyrgyz were discontent with the Russians were dealt with at once. And then came the tax collectors. Every man, woman, and child of you must pay the Yasak to the Tsar. This tax will be collected in furs, and every one of you must pay it. We received nothing in return for paying the Yasak. Only cruelty and force. Later, they took what gold we had. And when the war came in 1914, they took our cattle and sheep. We have given you rubles for your stock. But but the rubles are no good. It is money. What can we buy with it? It will buy nothing. You have taken our best land. We are hungry. We have bought your stock and given you money for it. What more can you ask? Money. We are hungry. And here at our feet are thousands of rotting carcasses of our sheep. Why did they kill our sheep and leave them here along the mountain roads to rot? The sheep were slaughtered before the Russians had cold storage for them. They have taken our lands and our furs and our gold. And now our stock. Are we to have nothing? They are leaving us to the mercy of the wind and the cold. The war in Europe was not our war. 
Yet, in 1916, the Tsarist government, without consulting any of my people, issued an order that all Kyrgyz men between the ages of 19 and 40... And by order of His Imperial Majesty, all Kyrgyz men from the age of 19 to the age of 43 are immediately to be conscripted for service in digging trenches and general duty at the battlefront. All Kyrgyz males between 19 and 43 will be mobilized. I will not go. I will fight them before I let them take me. Why should I go to the battlefront for Russia? Why? They are going to start taking us at once. At once? Where did you hear that? At the fortress. They are sending out Russians to count us and to learn our age and take us. They will not take me. They have taken all I have, but they will not take me. I will fight them, but I will not go. But they have guns and bullets, and we have none. We have pikes and axes, and they are sharp. They will come after us. Let us go after them. Now! Yes, the officials. Let us go after them before they come for us. To the fortress. After every official and soldier. They are guns and artillery. To the fortress. For the Russia. It's from the Kozak. Here they come. Here comes the The revolt of my people spread through all Kyrgyzstan. Blood flowed everywhere. My people killed the officials and the census takers and the Russian colonizers. And the Russians killed my people wherever they found them. The Russians tried to mobilize 600,000 Kyrgyz men, but they only had trains enough for 7,000. To put down the revolt, General A.M. Kuropatkin came to Kyrgyzstan. It is imperative that you natives of Kyrgyzstan know that the shedding of Russian blood is punished not only by the execution of the guilty ones, but also by the confiscation of the land of those who have proved unworthy. General Kuropatkin's soldiers pressed against my people, but they fought on with pike and axe and torch. Set the church on fire, too! The church is on fire! Hospitals and schools and churches, bridges and railways, all were destroyed by my people. And the Tsarist Russians drove after us. Thousands of Russians have been brutally murdered, and the number of Kyrgyz killed is not known. Many Kyrgyz were captured and tried by court martial. Of these, 347 were sentenced to death. But I found it possible to modify the sentence of many of these so that actually only 51 were executed. We have confiscated much of the land of the Kyrgyz and driven the Kyrgyzians out. This was General Kuropatkin's report to the Tsar. The massacre continued until my people were driven into the hills of China and Afghanistan. We lost 70% of our stock and 30% of our people in the World War. What other people lost so much? revolt had scarcely been put down when Tsarist Russia fell in October 1917. Immediately, the new Central Soviet government proclaimed the freedom and equality of all people in Russia. Any inequality among the peoples of the Soviet Union will be harmful. It will create discord. It will make the USSR weak and will play into the hands of hostile enemies and the Tsarist imperialists who wish to return to power. The USSR must stand for a national life within the Soviet republics, each with its own language, its own national tradition, its own land. Slowly, the exiled Kyrgyzians drifted back to the lands they had roamed so many, many centuries. In 1920, the Kyrgyz Soviet Republic was established. The Uzbeks, the Turkomen, the Tajik peoples also established their republics. The antagonism between the Kyrgyz and the other Asiatic provinces was not immediately overcome. But the Kyrgyzians, like the other peoples of Soviet Asia, set about putting their house in order. Began the conquest of the desert wastelands. Oh, come on, Ivan. Get up on the tractor. No, no. Come on, come on, get up on the seat. 
And we will show you how to run it. No, 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 no. I'm afraid. It is like sitting on a horse. It will not hurt you. It, it roars and trembles. It is angry. No, it will do anything you want it to do. Get out. Come. Come, let me help you up on the sea. No, 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 no. This is the way roads are built everywhere. We have to build this railroad through the waterless plains and the shifting sands of your Kyrgyzia. And we must use machines, tractors like this. No, 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 no. No, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm afraid. Oh, there he goes. Well. Ivan ran away. But several days later, he came back again. He watched the powerful tractors grading and clearing the sand for the Turk Sib Railway. Where this railway was built had been only camel caravans for centuries past. That's right, Ivan. Just sit there quietly on the sea. It is an iron monster. I will stand here beside you. It, it shakes and growls. Now, press your foot down on that thing right down there. Uh, uh, this down. Ah, and when you have it down... Pull this lever this way. Uh, uh, this one? Uh, uh, like this? That's right. My people watched Ivan and the other shepherds as they learned to run the tractors and other machines in building the railway. When Ivan overcame his fear, he became a first-class tractor manager. There's nothing to be afraid of. Come, Uko. I'll show you how to run the tractor. If it does not harm you, it will not harm me. Ivan has become very brave. He is becoming wiser. He is the master of the tractor now. Ivan can handle a tractor under any condition now. Look out over there. Now pull back that lever, Uku. That's it. Pull. With each day, Ivan learned more. He learned how to take care of his tractor as well as run it. He learned to read a little. He was no longer a simple shepherd. He began to ask questions. Is there really water with great boats far on the other side of those mountains? What kind of people live there? Are the boats really as big as our tractor? As the days went on, Ivan learned to understand the workings of his tractor. He learned why the sand must be graded and cleared from the railway. He learned the importance of a railway to him and to my people. He became a leader. Day after day, the tractor work went on. And when the railway was built through, a train brought a load of supplies to Ivan's village. A song was written for Ivan... And his name spread throughout Kyrgyzia. As Ivan learned, so have my people learned to live in this new world. In the space of a few years, the Kyrgyzians made the amazing transition from simple nomad life to a modern industrial life. The peoples of Soviet Asia were awakening, looking ahead working out their own destiny in the Soviet Union. The central Soviet government poured billions of dollars into the development of Soviet Asia. From European Russia came, and the root crime, came millions of peoples, people flooding in to develop the untouched resources of this great land. I am an electrician. I am an engineer. I am a teacher. These experts have come to Soviet Asia to develop our industries and to train our people to lead us out of the past. The people who came found oil and mercury and tin and lead and gold. They found coal and copper and water power. They found antimony and they found iron. And more and more experts came. I am an economist. I am a chemist. I am an architect. I am a doctor. I am a metallurgist. I am a director of industry. We have increased industrial production nearly 280% since the first five-year plan. And more and more people came to work, to build, to improve. Schools were started all over our Kyrgyz Republic. Teachers were trained to teach our young Superintendent, how many schools do we have? Fifteen hundred elementary schools. 
119 high schools and three universities. And uh, how many of our young people are pupils? More, more than 280,000. My people soak up all the education they can get. They thirst for understanding. Today in the Kyrgyz Republic, we have theaters, newspapers, magazines, libraries, motion picture houses. All are working toward the end. Through these channels, the national life, free from racial prejudice, is rising in Soviet Asia. The peoples of Soviet Asia, over whom the Russians once ruled, now rule over the Russians in their republics. Intermarriage between the Russians, the Kyrgyz, the Uzbeks, the Kazakhs, the Tajiks, and all the other peoples of Soviet Asia is now the custom. I have married a Russian woman, and we have three children. This is Ivan, the Kyrgyzian, who became a leader in clearing the railway with tractors. There is no race prejudice between my people and the Russians. We have the same opportunities as the Russians. We are all on even terms. The future of the Russians in Soviet Asia and the future of my people and all the peoples of Soviet Asia are one. Thus are the peoples of Soviet Asia tied together, the white men and the yellow men, the Mongoloids and the Slavs, tied together in common purpose. The same people who in 1916 were at each other's throat. Thus were they united when, in 1940... Hitler has attacked Russia! Hitler is bombing Russian positions. The Nazis are driving into Russia with all fury. The Nazis are smashing against Leningrad, Rostov, Kharkov. Hitler is driving past Smolensk on the road to Moscow. From the heart of Soviet Asia to help defend European Russia came Uzbek, Kazakh, Tajiks, Turkomen, and Kyrgyz. Seasoned cavalrymen, born to the saddle, who rode like wildfire. Look, our lad! They are charging directly into the murderous fire of the Germans. Nothing will stop them. The Germans are mowing them down. They will slaughter every German they can reach. So great was their courage, their contempt for self, that the Nazis admitted their fearlessness. As the Nazis drove toward Moscow, more fighters from Soviet Asia rushed to the front, took their place in the lines. In the battle before Moscow... Tanks are coming, Captain. See them through the smoke. Seven, eight, ten. They're coming down through the gully. There comes two more. Twelve tanks. We have got nothing but hand grenades. Yes. Boxes of gasoline. Wait for my order. Yes, comrade. How many of us are there left? Uh, Twenty-eight, comrade. That's all that's left, Captain. Twenty-eight? We must hold. We cannot let them break through. They have spotted us. They have opened fire. Down. Keep your hand grenades ready. Wait for my order. I'll scorch them to death for this gasoline. Now, throw. Throw your grenades and gasoline. As the enemy drove ahead on the other front, the industries of European Russia were moved back into the impregnable heart of Soviet Asia. With the industries moved millions upon millions of Russians, workers and war refugees from Kharkov, Leningrad, Kiev, Odessa, Sevastopol, 20 million immigrants. Between the Urals and Lake Baikal and eastward to where the Pacific washes up on the shores of Siberia, a new world emerged. Tens of millions of persons of a hundred different tribes building a new future, working as one people. Powerhouses and blast furnaces and factories. This is a new railway here, isn't it? Yes. Kyrgyzia had no railways before 1917. Hmm. A new railway. Why, this is like a new world out here. It is like your America when it was being settled after your civil war. Oh, uh, our West, you mean? Yes. All those people that have come here to our republic are like the pioneers 
the farmers and workers that built up your country. Yes, and the railroads were built through our west just as you've built them here in Kyrgyzia. Kyrgyzia is the west of Asia, thousands of miles from the Pacific. Oh, uh, who's this coming here? Huh? Oh, that is a railroad man. Hello, He's Julia. Russian. Oh, hello, sir. You are lining up another train? A special train. The Red Army has broken through to Leningrad. They have opened the rail traffic to Leningrad? Yes, and the Kyrgyz Republic is sending a trainload of gifts. Things made in our own factories and products grown on our own land by oh. our own people. They have lifted the siege of Leningrad. Well, they'll need that trainload, those people of Leningrad. They are our people. We will get it through to them. We must help them in every way we can. Was the uh, home of that trainman back there in European Russia? This is his home here. He has been here since the First World War. And he is married to a Kyrgyz woman. Hmm. He is one of us. He helped build this railroad. And today we have railroad connections with China and with Iran. Well, that means that Kyrgyzia, with all its resources, is a strategic base for the Allies, right in the heart of Asia. A stronghold, both now and after the war. Yeah. Oh, train's coming. Listen to that cheering. It is the train to Leningrad. They're soldiers. Our soldiers. They're going to fight beside the Russians at Lenin. Goodbye! 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 Goodbye. Honor us with all you do. Goodbye! 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 Goodbye. Ah, what enthusiasm. What spirit your people have. A new world is forming here. A great new world. Thousands of miles inland from where the Pacific washes the shores of Siberia, the landlocked peoples of Soviet Asia are transforming the wastelands into a rich nation which is playing an important part in the fighting of the war and will play an even more important part in the great Pacific era of tomorrow. And here to tell the underlying meaning of this remarkable development is Dr. H. H. Fisher, traveler and authority on Russia and professor of history at Stanford University. Dr. Fisher. Twenty years ago, in Moscow, a man came to my office. Here, said the Russian doorman, is some Chinaman to see you. A Chinaman? Yes, and he says he's come a long way because he has something important to tell an American. He will not go away until he tells it, and I think he will stay here forever. The Chinaman saw the American. He wasn't a Chinaman, though it was easy to see why the Russian took him for one. He was a Kalmyk, he told me, and he had come the long miles to Moscow from the hungry steppe, that desolate region on the lower Volga below the bend near which the city of Stalingrad stands. He had come because his people were starving, and he had heard that in Moscow there were Americans who had brought food from their far country for the hungry of Russia. He told me, very quietly, but at considerable length, the bitter story of his people, how badly they had fared at the hands of the Tsar, and how it was no better under the Soviets. His people, who long ago had been the masters of Russia for two centuries, now were dying of hunger. Unless the Americans could help them, their nation would perish. The nation did not perish. Mr. Hoover's American Relief Administration brought them food. The Soviet government, in the years that followed, gave to the Kalmyks what it gave to the other Asiatic peoples of Russia. First of all, a sense of national and racial equality with the Western people. And secondly, access to the great technological achievements of Europe and America. The Kalmyks and their kinsmen forgot the enmity of their fathers against the Russians, and at Moscow, as you have just been told, and at Stalingrad, they gave their lives to save the Russian land from the pollution of a brutal enemy. They gave their lives for that and something more, for the right of all the peoples of Asia, the yellow and the brown and the black, to national and racial equality and to equal access to those remarkable contrivances that science has put within the reach of Western man for his well-being. I do not know what will be the verdict of history on the Battle of Stalingrad, but no American can think of it without reverence and gratitude. 
But if we think of it only in terms of how much it has helped us to defeat our Nazi enemies, we shall miss its full significance. We must think of it in terms of the fundamental issues of the war. Those fundamental issues, as they appear to the youth of China and of the other countries of Asia, a young Chinese writer has summed up in one word, emancipation. They mean emancipation from foreign aggression, from foreign rule, from native exploitation. They mean the application to all the peoples of East Asia of the principles that Russia has applied to the Eastern peoples of the Soviet Union, the principles of national and racial equality and the end of imperialism. They mean what the founder of the new China, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, meant by his three principles of the people, national independence, political democracy, and economic and social welfare. They mean what our own great emancipator meant by government of the people, by the people, and for the people. How these great principles shall be realized depends in a great measure on how we and Russia stand in the face of this struggle for emancipation. We realize, when we look at the map of Asia, that almost half of that continent is within the Soviet Union. We can see that Russia and China have a long common frontier, almost 5,000 miles. We can foresee that in the age of air transport now dawning, inner Asia, where Russia and China and India meet, may regain the place it held before men learned how to cross the sea in ships. It is easy to see the geographical significance of these frontiers for the movement of people and goods by air, it is less easy to apprehend the political significance of another common frontier, a frontier of the spirit that joins Russia and Asia. This other frontier comes to light when we realize that Asiatic peoples on the whole have accepted Soviet culture more easily than the Russians themselves, that Soviet political techniques have proved more effective in China, for instance, than in Europe, that Soviet economic institutions seem in certain cases to be better suited than the institutions of the West to meet the conditions of Asia. Across this frontier of the spirit, Russia is expanding, not as a new imperialism disguised with fine phrases, and not at the expense of the peoples of Asia, but in unification with them through the adoption of similar political and economic systems. All of us who are willing to look beyond our noses, and sometimes this is a very disturbing experience, should recognize the imminence throughout East Asia of the spirit that within a single generation has so transformed the Asiatic peoples of Russia. It is a fact to be taken account of, not an occasion for hysterics. Let us not forget that we are fighting for the right of people to govern themselves in Asia as well as in Europe, and that the peoples of Asia are fighting to free themselves not only from Japanese warlords, but from the servitudes of their own past. The emancipation, the young Chinese writer speaks of, is on the way, and every victory over the Axis brings it nearer. When it comes, we must be able to recognize it for what it is. We may oppose it at our own great peril. We have the great privilege of giving our leadership, as Russians have done in Soviet Asia. We cannot stand aside. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Next week, at this same time, over most of these stations, the National Broadcasting Company will present another program on the Pacific with drama of the past and present and dedicated to a fuller understanding of the vast Pacific Basin. A reprint of tonight's Pacific Story program is available at the cost of 10 cents. Send 10 cents in stamps or coins to the University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The address again, University of California Press, Berkeley, California. is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The musical score is composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gain Whitman. This program has been presented as a public service by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>